and get started. Uh, this is our hopefully last meeting. I say hopefully because I do have quite a bit in here, but they're all little, so I think it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to go through the leftovers, basically. Um, a lot of it is error message related um, or error handling related, debugging. Um, some of it is error message related and some of it is just random stuff. So without further ado, let's start with the random stuff, the randomest of random stuff. Um, oh, and let me know if like I start cutting out or anything because I'm on hotel Wi-Fi and it might be awful. Uh, but so far it's been pretty good. All right, so the first random is this section on hashing. Uh, in the reference, it's like not even in a section. It's on, it's in the objects, like the stop, the top of the object section. And so we missed it. Um, there are just these two functions, hash and hash file. Hash will take any arbitrary R object and create like a string, a hash for it. And hash file takes a file, and does the same thing. And you can also give it, um, multiple paths Oops. Uh, for hash file, you can give it a character vector uh, with um, separate file paths, and then it'll create a different hash for each one. So for example, this is the hash file with two different files, and then um, it creates a hash. The reason for that is that you can like easily see, did it change um, when anything changes in the file? Um, so you can compare the hash for an old one to a ha the hash for a new one. Um, or you can create a hash for multiple files just by hashing the result there of the two, um, you know, two or more hashes that you get with hash file. So that's that. Um, the one thing that I did pull up on this is it says uh, it's guaranteed to, be guaranteed to be reproducible across platforms that have the same Indianness and are using mm -hmm. the same R version. And I, I think I had heard that term. Uh, but I could not remember what the heck that meant. And it's just uh, the order in which a sequence of bytes is stored in computer memory. So uh, big endian, uh, the most significant bytes, it's whatever. There's two different things. And it tends to be like processors all tend to be little endian. So you should, uh, your platform should have the same endianness unless it's weird is the the basics there. Yeah. So, um, but what's happening is because it's converting to binary, right? So, it's yes. converting to binary first, which is the Indian part, and then using that to convert to the hash using the hash, yes. the hash library, which is why exactly Indian matters. Yeah. Not that uh, it ever has mattered, but yes. <laughs> right. So yeah, that is something. I mean, if it's weird, uh, especially if on old old versions of R, it will be different. Um, and you know. Who knows in the future it could be different but if you're just using it kind of as a um check if the thing that they have if they already have the thing before you redownload it or something like that um you know at worst you're going to redownload it when they did already have it so um i mean i guess technically it's theoretically possible that you could have something that's the wrong file and it hashes the same but that's very very unlikely so uh so yeah that's that all right, next up, we have this back traces section. Um, this one got me excited. Uh, there's the global and trace enriches base errors, warnings, and messages with our line features. I was like, oh, so you can turn all the base error stuff into, um, you know, nice Arlang, Arlang errors, and then you can turn Arlang errors into CLI errors with something that we saw before, and so be all great and you can have all fancy pretty error messages except this is a user option um that they have info about using it in our markdown documents um basically i haven't played with it yet but i don't think you can use this like in a package uh there were actually some notes about uh reprex not playing nice with it and um, I, cause I went looking on GitHub to see if they use it anywhere, but it, it seems to be something that you just like, they recommend, um, you put it in, oh, there it is in your R profile. Um, so I mean, I, uh, actually I'm going to be doing the, a later thing that also that does this as part of it, um, on my personal system just to see things better, but it would be nice to be able to make the base error messages behave more nicely. 
um, and work with all these other things we're going to talk about. Um, the main thing on this is if you're using it inside of our markdown, it is, you know, it can be nice if you want to show error messages. Um, well, there are two ways. There's uh, whether you want, whether you you are intentionally showing error messages to users, that's one version um, of an error that can happen in our markdown. Or if you want the errors that you see yourself uh, when there is an error in your R markdown to have more information. Um, in both cases, this can be useful. Although I think uh, there was something, maybe it's in a different one about, yeah, there, there will be another help doc that talks about the difference between what you see and like what is actually reported in your report. Um, so we'll see that in a second. Um, I'm thinking about, like, I don't know if, if the, um, CI things do this automatically because the idea is that it shows you more of the context of where the error happened in the report. And so that's why you would want to do it in um, our markdown, but I could also see it being useful on CI. So I need to kind of look into where it's already done and where it isn't. Um, yeah, so that's that. Next we have all these okay uh the reason to do to do that or one of the reasons is that then last error works um so that you can like go back and see uh what all was in that error like what triggered that error um and then last trace does the back trace that you can get after you do last error just does it all at once um that's that's the basics of that one. There's not a lot to it, just that it's a thing that can be useful when you get an error message and you want to see more details about it. It's like the opposite of tra it, it's traceback exists though. So it's like I remember last trace being like traceback but printed in the other direction. Yeah, it's it's a little easier to read. Um and you know, there's it's more about like I think. I think it returns, it doesn't say, but I think last trace does return an object that you can then use for other things, possibly. So, um, but yeah, it's basically the back trace that is stored inside of last error is last trace. So, um, that's that. All right. Uh, Last warnings and last messages are just the um, warning and message version of that. Um, you have to uh, have global and trace going to log things. Um, and then it's, um, they're a simplified backtrace like in last error. So you can use summary um, somewhat surprisingly to print the conditions with the full detail. So if you just like call last error or last warning rather, what you're really doing is printing the condition. So you're getting the condition and then printing it. And you could call it inside of summary to get the condition and summarize it instead of printing it. Um, I'm curious if they show, they probably don't show an example of that, but uh, I have some kind of like that, that I will pull up in a minute where we are like getting the um, condition. All right. Moving on though. Um, so, okay, there is this setting, our lang, this uh, option, our lang backtrace on error that you can, uh, um, it's talked about in a couple of those things and it's what you can set um, to different values to kind of control um, how much last error shows. Um, I yeah, the default in interactive is for it to show reminder where it's just like, uh, tells you how to see the last trace. Um, you can say none to not show anything ever. Uh, branch for a simplified one and full for uh, the full tree. And again, you know, like this is the default for non-interactive. This is the default for interactive. Um, that is why actually I always wondered exactly what it was. Or, I don't know. I very slightly wondered, but didn't wonder enough to dig into it of why in um, for example, if you do a snapshot of an error message 
it's a lot more detailed than what you see in the console by default. And it's because the, in the console, you're getting just the reminder level. And in the uh, snapshot, you're getting the full. Um, and yeah, so you can, again, personally set it up so that uh, errors, base errors get promoted. Um, I think, you know, global and trace is basically doing this. Um, and then there, yeah, there's more info um, inside of, or about inside of our markdown documents, this Arlang backtrace on error report um, is for things that you are intentionally showing as error messages inside of a, uh, a an R markdown document. Um, you can use last error uh, in the next chunk after an error in an R markdown document. Just thought that was interesting. Um, and then you can do uh, unexpected errors. So errors that happen while rendering your R markdown document with R line backtrace on error. So on error versus on error report. Uh, and that's all the basics there. Uh, and again, also with warning, they don't have um you can do the warning report but you can't do our back backtrace on warning uh for normal uh r sessions you know for your personal errors uh that's all the the things i think um i do i think it's interesting to, that they still have some things in our lang where it's like oh they forgot like to link this um see also this thing but there's no link about it. All right, moving on to oh, uh, capture a backtrace. OK, yeah, so this is um, trace back. Um, OK, yeah, trace back and trace length. These are like functions that are used inside of Arlang, and you probably don't need to call them directly, uh, but they exist. You can tell it like how much of the tree you want to see. So how far back and, and starting from where. And then you can get, you know, this will return a trace and you can use trace length to find out how long it is. Um, again, you probably don't ever need to use this directly. You just use all the other tracing functions. And that's back traces. Any questions, comments, thoughts? There's more related to backtraces inside of the handle errors stuff. So probably let's just move on. All right. Um, there's also, okay, there's this global prompt install um, function that when it's on, it tells you, it gives you a nicer error message when there's um, a missing package. Uh, and so, you know, it's handy for you to use personally so that you um, get nice error messages if something is weird inside of a um, function. Uh, but, you know, tidyverse all uses, or at least mostly all uses this type of functionality. Um, and then the, the kind of wrapper is there is this global handle, which turns on, it's basically just global and trace plus global prompt install. So it's, uh, both of those wrap together. Um, so this is the one that I will be adding to my R profile just to make things tell me more information when there are errors. Uh, yep. All right. Um, I think we talked about try fetch in the condition section, but I couldn't remember for certain and it's in this section. So I went ahead and pulled it up. It's their version of uh, try catch basically. Um, it's, I don't know, the, the only reason to use it is, well, I guess there's, um, two is that it has all of the Arlang bells and whistles built in. So you can use, um, you know, uh, bang, bang, bang and such in, in places if it makes sense. And it's a nice standard interface that, uh, I find easier to remember. Um, and it makes for like prettier error messages. So that's what's going on with try to fetch. Um, uh, 
uh, I can't remember what the difference is there, but there is a subtle difference between try fetch and try catch. Um, and yeah. So yeah, the dots are dynamic. So that's the main difference really. Um, I can't remember if there's anything particularly uh, interesting in here. So, uh, and so technically try fetch is more like base with calling handlers than it is like try catch and it's actually built on top of that. So, all right. Uh, but yeah, I have been using try fetch, um, trying to get better about like whenever I'm doing something that could fail without me having a lot of control over it like all the API stuff I'm working on. Um, I try to make sure it's at least wrapped in try catch and I'm using things that use our line anyway, so might as well use try fetch uh, to, to handle the errors a little bit, you know, to, to make sure that they say where it happened, not just HTTPR2 through an error or whatever, um, but make it local and relevant, so. All right. Uh, Oh, uh, again, I think we saw these in conditions, but just to quickly go through them, caller arg um, is useful if you are uh, creating functions that will like th that create error messages for other functions. It's nice to know what the arg was called in the parent, and you know you can keep passing this uh, down the chain, and just in the function you say, okay, this is called or this is the caller arg. <laughs> found this hilarious. We're going to see this um, args error context. It has its own help coming up. For, that's, I think, that tab. They don't follow the guidelines that let you use uh, this tag in documentation. They usually call this thing x underscore arg, but sometimes they call it arg, and sometimes they call it error arg. Um, I used x underscore arg because that was the demo that I had. But now I know if I call it arg or error arg, there's an automatic documentation of what it is. And so I just thought that was kind of funny. And the way you use it is you say you know, arg is color arg x. So it's saying what is the name of x wherever this function was invoked from. Um, so uh, yeah, I have a whole package that has like error handling um, functions in it. And so like every function has what I called xarg and call um, arguments. And now I'm going to rename to standardize, I think. Um, and just the nice thing is then when you throw an error, you can refer to the error or to the argument by the name it had wherever it was being called from. So that's the whole idea there. But yeah, this inherit params. I, I like these because like if they find that the wording doesn't work and they tweak it, it's now tweaked everywhere. And so like you benefit from any updates. Now, technically you're also susceptible to their changes, but I'm willing to uh, put up with that. Um, actually, I'm gonna come back to this one. Just wanted to go quickly over that, that there's this Arlang args error context thing that you can just inherit params in your function definition and it'll automatically pull in these definitions. Um, but your your parameters need to be called arg, call, error arg, or error call. Um, and like then the yeah, idea is you then use them with dot arg and CLI to make it pretty. And then the call gets passed into abort. Um, and so you get pretty functions. Um, and this just shows you what it is going to generate automatically. Uh, I, I do like, like, I think I like the error arg and error call, uh, names because it really specifies the reason that we're passing these along is to make error messages pretty basically. Um, all right. So then to go back, there is this local error call. Um, so instead of passing the call argument, um, you can use this function. Um, and 
like it, it says, uh, you know, most of the time you probably just want to pass it. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, it shows the example. So it says error and foo, uh oh, but if foo is actually calling arg check, you don't want to say error and arg check. You want to say error and foo because the user doesn't know what the heck arg check is. Um, and they don't know what X is because, or they do, uh, they do know what X is because they hear it's being used. But, um, you know, if it had said arg or error arg is failing, that wouldn't be very helpful. Um, so, uh, so yeah, then they do this error arg and caller env, blah, 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 blah. Um, but sometimes it's, uh, tricky to pass, keep passing all that stuff around. So local error call basically lets you do it um, kind of locally. Uh, so for wherever it was called from, and then you can like kind of keep going with that uh, down the path. I, and I'll show you an example of this because it did not make sense to me just from their demo. I didn't feel like it um, went deep enough to really make sense of how you do it. Um, but they, okay, so they have some additional info. Oops, that's not it. Let's go over to here. Oh, but you can't see that. I need to find my file and then share that screen. All right. Hello, Priyanka. I did not realize you were here. Um, trying to make room. So, okay, we have. I have these functions that uh, accidentally collapsed. Um, they're using this local error call thing, and the idea is instead of passing it as an arg, you can like um, use it. Use this inside of the function to just set stuff up. Um, and so what it's doing is it's saying now within G, the error call environment is the caller environment. Um, and so if I do anything else inside of G, it would make a lot more sense if there were like a bunch of calls and things. Um, but all of them will be as if it's in that world. Uh, and then I've got, you know, just passing, passing, passing. And then finally, I... Um, oh, that's... I didn't set up the um did I undo or um I thought this was gonna do or I thought I had this set up to be an if then, but maybe I only have it in I'm not sure I had this. Okay. Cause what I wanna do is uh yeah, okay, let me just uh, copy this. That um uh, if missing X, then um, I throw an error. Otherwise, I don't is what I'm going to do here. And so um, I'm setting up these functions, and then we're going to come back to the twos in a minute. But so there's just this, uh, the ones without twos, uh, if it, uh, if not missing. So if I pass something in, I can make it, uh, oh, and I re, uh, do that. There we go then it throws an error. But the important part is it thinks that the error happened in F even though it happened in I. That's all that I, that this is trying to show. Um, and then there's also these uh, second versions where I it's the same thing as far as it like it looks like. Um, but what it's doing oops, is instead of doing the local error call even so you can do it with a name or you can set this variable and the reason to do that version is, and this is where it actually becomes possibly useful. Um, so I have this error handler that will just make it return the same thing either way, but it returns it by throwing an error and then the error being caught. So I wanted to do that so that I can benchmark um, that. Uh, so F, OK, this is where it's not throwing an error with the original version. F2, OK, it's not throwing an error with F2. Uh, it is throwing an error with the original version. And it is throwing an error with the F2 that has like the performance optimization thing. Um, F, uh, 
Yeah. Okay. So um, I didn't see that before because I I screwed up and didn't have the error version. So actually, I didn't realize it was going to do this. But so the F version, um, it's slightly slower, like very very slightly slower when there isn't an error. Um, well, actually, I, so I tricked myself because I saw this huge difference between F and uh, F2 before. Um, but yeah, so the, the idea is that F2 is very slightly faster, uh, especially the, the when there isn't an error, it doesn't have to do as much work. It's only um, you know 1.4 times faster. Uh, both of them are very slow when there is an error. But the idea is you want to be super fast in some cases, like if you have a function that gets called a lot. When there's not an error, you probably want to just pass through that function really quickly. But when there is an error, who cares if it takes longer because it's going to stop anyway. Um, and so that is the idea there. The difference isn't as dramatic as I thought it was because I was seeing it. Um, I had a mistake in my function before, so not as interesting as I thought it was going to be. But in, I have a case where performance might technically matter. Um, and so that might be something that I play with. Uh, and then the other thing um, that uh, I'm going to call it, I'm not going to show the um, the help for this right now, but there's this other function, catch underscore CND, catch condition. Um, and it just captures the condition um, that you can then use for other things. And so, uh, so I'm just showing it as if, um, okay, I'm trying to pass it into this variable. And if you do a normal, just stop, it's not going to actually catch the error. It's going to throw the error um, versus, okay, yeah, I did actually catch it. And then uh, I have that thing as a parent error that I can now do things with, for example. So, um, and I did find it interesting that when you catch it, it actually, uh, you'll like, I don't think you can yeah, you can't pass through a um, a, ca a calling environment. You might be able to do it with the uh, error call stuff, but you can't do it um, like there's no argument to pass it through. And so it's saying that it's in force because there's a force inside of uh, somewhere deep, actually right there. there. Inside of catch condition, there's that force. And so it says, oh, that's where the error took place. Um, think that's a little bit interesting but the main idea okay is we can say classes like by default the classes are just all conditions i can say classes are error and it catches it but i can say classes are some specific thing that i'm looking for to deal with that uh that one it didn't get caught because it didn't belong to my error class and again even a normal or an arlang abort doesn't get caught but if I give it that class, it gets caught and it doesn't throw the error. And so you can use that if in a certain situation, the error doesn't matter, or if you wanna throw a different error when there, that error occurs or different things like that. Um, so that's what's going on there. Uh, and that is all I had over here. So I'm gonna switch back to the other screen. Uh, uh, so as I find it. All right, so that was a, a whirlwind, um, but that's that's all the error handling stuff. Um, next up, we have search path. So there, are, um, or yeah, just these general path uh, related functions. Um, they have a help doc that's kind of nice. That's just all about um, what are search paths basically. It's the chain of environments containing exported functions of attached packages. So there's um, like the base uh, base function search will get you the name of all the environments. Uh, but then there are all these rlang functions that um, make things a little cleaner. So you can get uh, search ends to get the environments on the search path as a list, um, a list of environments specifically. Uh, you can get the name of a package environment uh, for a package, just it basically it just attaches package colon uh, to get you a nice uh, package env name. Um, package env returns the actual environment uh, if it's attached. 
global env and base env are the simple or are the um base or basic simple environments and uh is attached is um to see is uh the search name or packing environment attached to the search path um so in various places you're throwing or giving names or package names um or an environment uh yeah, that's that's the basics. Um, the one caveat is that if it there are cases where it doesn't have necessarily have a name, and then it it will, um, actually that's not in this group. It's in a different group of functions. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, okay. So yeah, that's just ways to grab. Oh, actually, something that is useful here is um, I was trying. In a like just within a test, I was I'm doing some things with uh use this and like use this stores information about the active project, for example, um in an environment. And there are functions that you can call in use this, but they will always kind of touch it and and like activate a package if it's not already active. And so if you're trying to do the more internal thing of just seeing. Uh, what does use this think the active package or active um, project is? You can act access the use this environment and just look in the variable. Uh, I think it's called proj that's inside of package env um, and see what it's set to. If anything, it could be set to null. Um, and so that is where being able to do this, like it, it feels like cheating. <laughs> like you can look inside of another package uh, from your own package and they don't have to have exported things. And I don't think this gets you the ding that if you do a um, three colon gets you in uh, CRAN. Now it does seem like probably a bad idea in a lot of cases because it's not something that's exported, but um, it's just, it's an option at least. Um, MTM, the, that's boring. It's just, that can get the empty environment, which is like the top. Uh, it's the one that doesn't have a parent. Um, is namespace. Again, it just checks, hey, is this thing in namespace? Uh, and get the namespace of a package. You can get the NS namespace environment. Um, you can get the environment that is all the packages or all the, the environments of the packages that a given package imports is NS imports env. Um, and then uh, you get the name of namespace. Um, so, and that's like, check out advanced R. Uh, I did reread that recently about the difference between like the namespace environment and the package environment um, and different things like that. So all kinds of fun there. All right. Um, so there are, um, like labels for lots of environments, but not every environment. Um, and so that's what this env name is about. An env name, like the only difference, there's this env name and env label. Um, env label uh, returns the memory address. So let me just go, go right down to the example. Uh, they created an, an env, or you're using env to create an environment that doesn't have a name. Env name will return an empty string and label will return the memory address. And that's like the only difference between these two functions. Otherwise they are just take an environment and turn it into a string. That is the name of that environment. Um, again, very limited use cases probably, but um, I can, you know, vaguely imagine things where it might come up. All right, uh, the final section, state. Um, is installed and check installed are uh, their way of um, looking at whether a, fun a package is available. If you ever do uh, use th use this, use package and put something in suggests, it'll give you code to use to check uh, that this thing exists before you try to use a, a function from that package, since it's only in suggests. Um, the difference is, is installed just returns true or false. 
check installed does the check. And if it's interactive, it asks the user, hey, do you want to install this thing? Otherwise it errors. Um, or if they say no, it errors. Um, and yeah, you can disable the prompt if you want with a, a argument that we'll see in a minute. Um, and that is, oh, um, you can say a reason. So um, say why the package is needed and that'll show up in error messages and in the prompts if it's in interactive. So I thought that was, I don't think I had noticed that before. So that's nice to know. And then you can either give the package name like you would in a description file. So package, you know, greater than equal 1.0.0, or you can separate out version into a vector vector that's the same length as package and compare of the greater than or equals um, into a vector that's the same length as package. Um, and then uh, there's also action. So um, that you can have it uh, do something. So this is, um, I believe if you set that, uh, I didn't test this out, but I'm pretty sure if you set that, um, it kind of, it overrides the pack install piece and it'll do whatever you say to do there, I think. And I need to play with that to make sure it might do both. Um, but yeah, so that's the action. Um, argument and then call, they always have call, uh, or in a lot of these, at least the check functions, cause it's gonna throw an error. And so you can tell it uh, where the error context should be. So should it be the function you're calling from, which is the default, or maybe you have something way up the chain that you wanna pass in there. Um, and that's the, that's the basics. Okay. Um, I. There are certain functions in Arla, Arlang that for a long time I was like, you just like you just don't like dots in the names of things. Um, and so you made is underscore interactive to replace is dot interactive. But they're actually or it's not even is dot interactive, it's just interactive in base. But there is a reason for it other than just the name that you can trick Arlang is interactive using uh, options, the Arlang interactive global option. Um, or with with interactive and local interactive, you can tell it that it is interactive or tell it that it isn't interactive even when it is. Um, and so it's useful for tests is the main reason to use our lang uh, is interactive rather than using the um, the base interactive. I think that's the only reason really, um, but it's uh, it's I mean it's a pretty good one and I have run into that where, you want to you want things to behave differently um like especially if you want to be able to run tests uh manually and have it behave the same as when you run the test automatically that this lets that happen all right um there's local options with options those are just like all the other local and with functions so they set it and then they set it back when whenever it's done um, push options is just uh, set options. Um, and peak options is to get options. Um, I, this one I really do think is just uh, because they like to standardize names. So I don't think it does anything other than what uh, get option and options do. It's just that it's a clearer uh, naming convention. There is there's peak options where you can get a bunch of names or peak option that you get a single name. Um, so this returns a list versus this returns a value single you know the single value. Ah, uh, yep, yeah, that's all of that. Uh, and then this one actually I think is still a little bit in flux because I was following an error message situation where uh, I think it was uh, Gabor didn't like this, that it caused something to be harder to debug than if it were just in dot onload. Um, but the general idea of onload is you can put these onload calls locally in your code where um, you want something to happen on load. You put them like scatter them throughout your files in your package. And then you put on package load in your onload um, 
sorry, no, you put run on load in your dot on load uh, file or call within the package and it like gathers up all the on load expressions. Um, and then the uh, separate function in here is on package load. You can tell it to do something when another package is loaded. I haven't found a particular case for this yet, but um, seems like it could be useful to make your package work with another package nicely or something. Um, so yeah, that's the basics there. I don't know, um, I don't remember what the issue was and I haven't seen any follow-up on that. So um, just might be worth digging through. I think it was specifically within our lang using onload was weird or something like that. So it's probably just that case still. Um, so yeah, they can be anywhere um, and it's, you know, via dot onload. So they're related um, and use onload in general, whether you're using their version or the um, built-in R version. When you need something to happen in the user's session uh, when the package is loaded versus something that would be like pre-packaged. Um, so like just the, the most basic example is if you want the time that the package was loaded, obviously you can't do that when the package is built because that's not the time when it was loaded, it was the time when it was built. Uh, so you could do an onload that generates a variable that is the time or if, you know, for some reason you need that. Uh, and then the other reason is if you um, want to make sure something uh, updates even though it's calling uh, a function. And so again, this is, if you were setting a variable not inside of a function within your package, then uh, that's when you would in, do it on load instead. And it sets it to be like in the namespace of the package um, outside of any given function. Uh, so that's that's all of that. Um, I do use, you know, I have an occasional use of dot onload and um, I don't know. I just haven't decided to make the transition to using onload, and then you um, use run onload inside of dot onload. Um, if you only have one thing, it's probably not worth it. But I did have, um, uh, I think, a, like a simple case is I had a package where uh, I had several different memoized functions, and you can. If you use the rlang onload, you can put the memoization at the definition of the function instead of having to put, remember to put them all into your dot onload. So um, that'd be the, the only, like that's a case that I can see being pretty useful. All right. And then the last thing is there's this uh, FAQ about the, the options that Arlang uses. So there's Arlang Interactive, which we just saw today. It's just um, a an option that's true or false that says whether it is interactive or if it's empty, it uses the actual state of interactiveness. Um, and then Arlang Backtrace on Error we saw earlier. I do think it's kind of funny because um, there's also Backtrace on Error report and uh, Backtrace on Warning report, which are not shown here, but whatever they're described elsewhere, I guess. Um, Arlang trace format source wrap, source refs. Uh, if you set this to true, uh, it said that, you know, it's implying here that um, source refs would be printed as part of the backtrace. Source ref is like the code that's used to generate a function. So um, it's basically it's the body of the function, but it's the, it, it includes the comments and whatnot. Um, so, uh, you know, I could imagine that being pretty noisy if you did that, but maybe, you know, <laughs> presumably this exists because they wanted to see it sometimes. And so, uh, that's the thing. And then our lang trace top and, uh, which is in this trace back, you can tell it where to stop looking basically. Um, and they used examples Well, like within the trace bank examples, they, uh, set this to the current environment because otherwise it's going to go back through like the renderer and different environments of when this document was created and they wanted it to stop at the 
point where they're calling these things the you know inside of the examples um and that is the end so that's that's all of the Arlang documentation um and i don't have my chat showing but i can see uh that oops priyanka's there's only one thing in chat there we go <laughs> oh. when that was leaving that was the only thing he left yeah okay um so yes uh we made it uh you know obviously this uh will be up on uh youtube um most people are probably watching this on youtube right now so um <laughs>